Proverbs 16, 16 says, how much better than fine gold is the acquisition of wisdom. And the acquisition of understanding is more choice than silver. The Bible is to be chosen over gold. It is to be chosen over great wealth. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a Welcome today to Word Alive. I'm Pastor Bob Rogers of uh, Evangel World Prayer Center right here in Louisville, Kentucky. I want to say that we're getting into the Easter season. And it's very important that you as a believer go to church. Last year, the uh, churches were closed down, first time in almost 3,000 years since the time of Passover. And now we have an opportunity to worship God. In some places, uh, the churches are still closed. Go find your church. Go to church on Easter. But also... I want to encourage you to do this, to wear a cross. If you're a lady, wear a cross. If you're a man, hold on to a cross. Put a cross in your pocket. This is the season of the cross. And I share that because there are many others that are wearing satanic crosses or they'll take a cross, a Christian cross, and turn it upside down, which is sacrilege. And if people of notoriety and Hollywood personalities and political people can do this, and they're not embarrassed to wear a satanic cross, then we as Christians need to wear a cross. It makes a statement. And I have today something that I want to send to you. First is a book I've written entitled Seven Sins That Are Nailed to the Cross. I want you to read this book. It's a, it's, it will bless you. And then I have a sterling silver cross for ladies. This cross is something that you can wear with pride. It's something that actually they're very difficult to find. And we had a jeweler that helped us to get these crosses. And then I have the wooden cross and this is made of olive wood and it comes from Jerusalem. It's called the Jerusalem prayer cross because it fits so comfortably in your hand. It's something you can reach in your pocket and, and get a hold of. You can hold on to it while you pray. It's a great blessing to you. And then fourthly, I have a prayer guide and a prayer pattern for the season of the cross. I want to send all four of these gifts to you for your generous gift. The way you can receive it is uh, go to the website. You see it right there. And for your gift of $50, which helps us to spread the gospel, uh, I'll send you all four of these, and we'll, you'll receive them just as quickly as uh, we hear from you. There's also a number you can call as well and that will expedite, expedite uh, the, this process. But I want you to draw close to God, and remember the power is in the cross. Today, I want to take you into our services where we go into part two of our power in the reading of the word. Please, Hebrews 4, 12. In Hebrews chapter 4, in the 12th verse, would you read it with me, please? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is the Word of God, and it never changes, but the Holy Spirit anoints God's Word. And when it does, it becomes alive. It becomes alive like you've never experienced something before. It'll talk to you. It's alive and full of power. It's the living word of God. It's called the rhema. You read it and suddenly it jumps alive in your heart. And suddenly you believe that you could do whatever that word declares you could do. 
So you take that word and you use it as a pencil and you draw that promise around you. All the way around you, 360 degrees, and you stand on the inside of that promise. And you don't come out of that promise. You don't come out of that circle until God brings it to pass. Till God saves your family. Till God heals your body. Till God releases the income. Until God answers your prayer, it's based upon the power of the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the rhema Word of God. Not the logos, it's the rhema Word of God. We read here, the Word of God is quick and powerful. The word quick is alive. It's a rhema. It gets in your spirit, and it begins to burn in Jesus' name. In Joshua 1 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That means you speak it. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That means you think it. That thou mayest observe to do all that's written therein. That means you do it. For then, say then, then. you speak, you think, you do. Then, it says, you will find uh, good favor and success and, and prosperity. For then thou shalt find. I forgot how it says. But you shall find, uh, what does that say? Then you shall find good understanding. Help me out here. You can't think of it either. I have it either. Then, hallelujah, praise God. Joshua 1.8, I'm going to read it here. It says, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success and uh, And uh, that happens simply from reading the Bible. Did you know success? That's the only time it's recorded in the Bible. And it's recorded about when you read it. John Knox, he was from Scotland. He got a job as a bodyguard, which meant he probably was a pretty tough guy. This uh, preacher was a reformer, and people tried to kill him, so he had to have people to protect him. Well, the reformer was caught. He was burned at the stake. And John Knox, because he worked for him, ended up going and they put him on a prison boat. He worked there for three years. But when he got through all of that, God called him to preach. And so he came back to Scotland. And in those days, Scotland was the poorest of all of the countries. It was the poorest country in Europe, the poorest country in Great Britain. It would be like living in a a coal town up in Appalachia that doesn't have any electricity. That's what Scotland was all about. The Church of England denied the right for anybody to read the Bible. The fact is, if you tried to read it or you could quote the Bible, in many cases, you were put to death. You were executed. And so they said you have to be learned and educated to understand the Bible. But not uh, John Knox. His message was it's so easy so under, to understand that anybody can understand the Bible. So when he would start a church, he would also start a school. He wouldn't start a church without starting a school, and the textbook was the Bible. And so you were taught to read and write and memorize the Scriptures. And as you begin to do so, it begins to have a radical effect upon the country of Scotland. There was a total change in 50 years. And then in another 50 years, it, they begin to take what they have learned and the blessings, and they begin to export it throughout the world. Alexander Fleming, who invented pen- penicillin, he was a Scot. Uh, Scotland produced more Nobel Peace Prize winners than any other country in Europe. Uh, The founder of the Bank of England, he was a Scot. Robert Louis Stevenson, John Burns, 650 other authors, poets of renown, they all came from Scotland. And then their contribution to America was unbelievable. Many of the writers and signers of the Constitution they were, they were from Scotland. And then financially, look, look what they produced. Andrew Carnegie, he came here without 
any money just as a kid, but he read the Bible. Became the richest man in the world. Founded U.S. Steel. There was Thomas Edison, Alexander Hamilton, Stonewall Jackson, John Breckenridge, Washington Irving, who wrote Ichabod Crane and Rip Van Winkle and other books. What happens is the Word of God made Scotland become the most prosperous place on the globe. And it'll make you prosper. It'll make your sons and your daughters successful, simply the Word of God. Secondly, it'll make you a leader. It'll make you rise to the top. Proverbs 16, 16 says, How much better than fine gold is the acquisition of wisdom, and the acquisition of understanding is more choice than silver. The Bible is to be chosen over gold. It is to be chosen over great wealth. You can take a, a young man who graduates from Harvard University. He can have all the education. He can have all the understanding. But if he can't get up and go to work, if he is not honest, if he doesn't have integrity, he is not as good as someone with a high school education that will get there early and leave late, who won't call in sick but crawls in sick, someone that's honest, someone that you can depend on. I'm here to tell you without the Bible, our democracy cannot exist. We are made, this a democracy is made for honest people and for people whose strength is based upon the Word of God. Sometimes we have to defend the Word of God. I don't have to defend the Word of God, just like I don't have to defend a tiger shark. I don't have to defend a lion or a bear. God's Word can defend itself. And those who've laughed at the Word of God, look at them. Look at Adolf Hitler. He's not laughing now. Where's Goliath? I don't hear his laugh. Where's Pharaoh? He's at the bottom of the Red Sea. Where's Joseph Stalin? He is one of the, he, he's dead. They're all dead. But look around those who believe God's Word. They will endure forever in the name of Jesus. God's Word will prosper you. God's Word will make you at the head and not the tail. God's Word will heal you. Raise your right hand. Say there's healing. Say there's healing in the Word of God. The book of Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto thy sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. That word health comes from the same word where medicine comes from. In other words, God's word becomes a medicine. Did you know medicine is no respecter of persons? Medicine, you can take it if you're black. You can take it if you're white. You can take it if you're uh, from Asia. You can take it if you're from Europe. It has, it's no respecter of persons, and neither is God's Word. Hallelujah. When you begin to read the Word of God and speak the Word of God, results begin to happen. Things begin to change. But it has to be taken according to the, uh, the directions. You just can't take medicine anytime you need it. I was talking to a doctor. He said, now you've got to take this every day. I said, well, what if I take it every other day? He said, it won't work. You got to take it every day. Well, it's the same with the Word of God. You got to follow the directions. It takes time for medicine to work. People always give medicine time. Well, it takes a little while for it to kick in. So they go through one prescription and they get a refill. And then they give more refills. But if God's Word doesn't happen by the time you count to 10, you're ready to throw it up and give up. But I'm here to tell you, you've got to give God's Word a little time. And it plants its seed, and it begins to grow, and it begins to mature, and it brings healing and life in Jesus' name. Come on. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Hallelujah to the Lord. I'm talking about the power of the Word of God. But let me tell you the third thing that God's Word will do. It'll save your soul and keep you from going to hell. The other night I was watching a, an old movie. It was called Mutiny on the Bounty. 
I had to read that book when I was in school. But it's the true story of a, of a, a sea captain who was notorious, Captain Bly. And while they were in the South Pacific, uh, there was a mutiny. And there were nine of the sailors that took over from the ship. And they were accompanied by uh, Tahitian men and women who accompanied them. And eventually, they found their way to this little island called uh, um, Pickran Island. It was a tiny dot in the South Pacific. It was only two miles long and a mile wide. And uh, ten years later, uh, through drinking and fighting, it left only one man alive. That was John Adams. Eleven women, 23 children, and that was the rest of the island's population. And it's a familiar story because we've seen it, but a part of that story that never was revealed is this. John Adams was going through the, the, um, uh, the material there that they took from the ship, and he discovered the ship's Bible. And for the first time in his life, he began to read the Bible. And as he began to read it, it suddenly changed him. He quit drinking. He quit quarreling. He quit, quit cursing. He gave his life to Christ, and then he began to teach the children. He began to tell them the stories in the Bible, and every person on that island was born again. And the fact is, today, there's about 100 is the population of that island, and every one of them are Christians today. It changed by the power of the Word of God. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Now, it's very important for us to understand that we stand and we make our confession of faith. This is the Word of God, and I believe it's true. Say it with me. This is the Word of God, and I believe it's true. It never changes. When people take a stand and they embrace anything outside of the Word of God, then they don't believe it's true. And one of their excuses is this. Well, the Spirit trumps the Word. Well, that's a lie born out of the pit of hell. The Spirit does not trump the Word of God. It comes into an agreement with the Word of God. And if anyone, the Bible says, even an angel appears to you and has any other message other than what's in God's Word, you're to reject them. There was a, a pastor who embraced homosexual marriages. And so uh, one of our pastors here emailed him, and he emailed back and said, well, says, uh, we're walking in love, and the Spirit trumps the Word. Well, you can walk in love and follow God's Word. God's Word never changes. Say that with me. God's Word never changes. And so when that gets in your spirit, you begin to understand that, this, that we believe what's in the Bible. And we're going to follow what the Word of God declares. Now, over history, over history, people have felt like they can bypass God's Word and they have power over God's Word. Well, let me tell you, the prophecies will come to pass. One of the great prophecies that's recorded has to do with the golden gate or the eastern gate that's in the Bible. I'm going to be taking a lot of young people to Israel, and I'm going to take them to this gate. I'm going to take them to the golden gate, the eastern gate, because in Ezekiel chapter 44, it was prophesied, Then the man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, one facing east, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be open. No one may ever enter through it. It will remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. And it goes on to say, the, the prince will enter through this gate, or the Messiah. Well, Jesus was uh, speaking on the Mount of Olives. He came down from the Mount of Olives. He went up into... Jerusalem, and he went through the eastern gate. And that's recorded in the book of Luke. 
And then that was in 30 AD. In 70 AD, the Romans came and they destroyed the temple and that gate was closed. They, uh, from time to time, they tried to do things to build the city walls and then the Ottoman Empire rose and under Solomon the Magnificent, he came and the, 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 uh, uh, he heard that a king was going to come. And this king would come and he would go through the eastern gate. Well, of course, that king was to be the Messiah, but the Jews believed it was a physical king that would be a warrior king. So he went outside of that eastern gate and he, he uh, had a cemetery built for Muslims because no holy man would ever cross through a Muslim cemetery. And that would keep any invading king from coming into the eastern gate. And it was that way for 400 years. And then in the 17, 1917, on uh, December the 9th, the city of Jerusalem was surrounded by the British army. They were ready to take that city. The Ottoman Empire was, was following falling and, and uh, becoming uh, disassembled. And the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, he was the Arab leader over Jerusalem. He had decided to board up and brick up and close down all of the other entrances into Jerusalem except the eastern gate, and they were going to blow it open because that would be the easiest gate to defend so he had all of his men to come and with their picks and with their sledgehammers, they were going to bust open the eastern gate. And the very moment the guy was ready to take the first hit with the sledgehammer, General Allenby sent planes over Jerusalem that began to drop handbills. And those handbills called for the surrender. He said, lay down your arms and surrender. And the Arab... A uh, translator who wrote that could not de figure out how to write Allenby, so he wrote Allah. And so when they read, surrender, lay down your weapons, signed Allah, uh, Allah, and they saw it falling from the planes. They'd never seen planes. They'd never seen electricity. They thought it was supernatural coming from God, and not one hammer hit the eastern gate, thus fulfilling the ancient prophecy of Ezekiel. Then in 1967, General or King Hussein of Jordan was in control of, of the Temple Mount. And he had gotten mad at the Jews. He had closed off the place where they could worship there at the Western Wall. And uh, so he decided he was going to build a hotel there on the Temple Mount. And once and for all, he would destroy any dreams for the Jews to ever have the Temple rebuilt. And he was going to open the eastern gate. And the Arabs would be able to enter right through the eastern gate and right there at the Temple Mount. And the day, the very day, that they were going to begin to bust the wall and bust the gate open, the Six-Day War started. And those plans were scrapped. And during those Six-Day War, there was a... There was an Israeli squadron. They came and they said, Let, let's, let's blow this gate open. And way, that way we can get right in. And they began to put the explosives against that uh, blocked up wall. And one of those uh, fellows said, he was a Messianic Jew. He said, wait a minute. This is the eastern gate. And the Bible prophesies that we can't do that because the Messiah will enter this gate. So they took the explosives down. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God's Word is eternal. In 1995, there came a deranged Israeli who felt it was his mission to go and blow up the eastern gate and go in and blow, down the, uh, blow up the Dome of the Rock. He was strapped with explosives. And as he was getting ready to blow up the eastern gate, the Israelis caught him. Ladies and gentlemen, that God's Word is eternal. God's Word will not fail. 
God's word of healing for you will come to pass. God's word of blessing for you and your family will come to pass. If you'll read the word of God, he will be with you. It will come to pass in Jesus' name. Can I hear an amen? amen? I want every head bowed. If you're here today and say, Pastor Bob, I'm not right with God. I'm not at the place I ought to be with the Lord. But I know that the Lord is getting ready to come back again. I know that our days, the days are going to have to be cut short. And I want to make things right with the Lord today. Would you pray for me? Can I see your hand? Just slip your hand up. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Are there others? Slip your hand up. Say, Pastor, I've got things in my life that aren't pleasing to the Lord. Yes, yes. I want us all to stand, everybody standing. I want you to join hands with people on either side of you. I want us to pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I invite you afresh and anew into my life. Take out of me what the devil's put in me and put back in me. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's program. And before we leave the air, I want to pray a prayer for you. I want you to place your hand right here on your heart. And I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, you have a plan for my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me today from all evil. Devil, get out of my life. Get out of my family. In Jesus' name. Now pray with me out loud the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I, once again, I have these four gifts I want you to have. One is the seven sins nailed to the cross. Secondly is the olive wood cross. It comes from Jerusalem. It's called the Jerusalem Prayer Cross. And then there is the beautiful uh, sterling silver cross for ladies. And fourthly is the prayer guide, prayer guide that's based on the cross. We'll, we'll send all that to you and the information how you receive it is right there on the screen. God bless you and I look forward to seeing you this time next week. Understand what the will of the Lord is. If we will seek Him, God will show us how to be blessed. God will break off of us whatever the devil has put on us in Jesus' name. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.